Hey guys, and welcome back. So today is a very special day because we launched the first video, interview video on queer. Yeah, I've been working on this project for such a long time and I'm so excited to actually finally get to share everybody's stories with you guys. Our first guest is Mackie Maximilian. Mackie and I have actually known each other for about three years now. We met out one night dancing and absolutely hit it off. And yeah, we've just kept in contact ever since. In fact, she's the first trans person that I've ever met. So I reached out and told Mackie about the project that I'm working on, Queer, and asked her if she would like to collab because Maggie and I have never had the opportunity to sit down and talk about her story. So we have filmed an hour and a half of content where Mackie is just so raw and so open and really lets us into what her life has been like. So what I've done is I've condensed this into two 20 minute parts. So in part one, we are gonna explore what life was like for little Maximilian Garcia in the Philippines and when her family moved her to Canada where she met her first trans woman which inspired her to transition herself and what life was like after. In part two, we are gonna navigate the dating scene with Mackie on the apps, in dating shows and relationships and then we're gonna dive into a little bit more deeper on what are some of the struggles that Mackie had to overcome in her life. And we talk about trans issues and acceptance in the LGBTQ plus community. So stay tuned and before I go ruining anything else, let's dive in. Welcome. Hi, and hi. Hi, <laughs> welcome. And um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, hello. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Maxi, and I'm a makeup artist, and I've been doing makeup for around six years now. Ooh. Yeah, lucky. I'm also on YouTube. Yeah, you are. Please like <laughs> and, and follow. Instagram. Please like and follow Maxi Maximilian. That's yeah. kind of my gig right now. <laughs> Amazing. Love that. Love that. Let's jump straight into your story. So, a little travel back in time. So, how it all began, I was born in the Philippines in mm -hmm. Manila. I grew up there. Uh, just outside of Manila, a uh, nice little city called Quezon City, and I grew up with two brothers, um, a very Catholic upbringing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was enrolled in wow. all boys Catholic school from yeah. a very young age, uh, but I was already showing signs of being super femme yeah. and super girly. You know, we had neighbors, and I was always over at my uh, girlfriend's uh, place. Mm -hmm. My parents assumed I had this little schoolboy crush on this yeah. cute girl. Yeah. <laughs> little did they know I was playing with her little dolly. Really? Yeah. So I would like trade her a truck, toy, whatever the hell, matchbox, you know, yeah. for her little girly toys. I used to play with dolls too. I did. Love them. Everybody should play with dolls. Fourth grade, I think, is when, you know, in Catholic school, they start discussing puberty yeah. and, like, your body's changing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And they explain it, you know, you know, this is the body you'll be growing into. You're all boys in class. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah. You talk about, like, you know, the changes and, you know, getting more masculine. And I was, like, devastated because I assumed for some reason I was so oblivious. I assumed it was, like, those video games where you get to choose and pick <laughs> your character. character and I was like I'm gonna look like Sailor Mercury or yeah, whatever and yeah. I was just like floored and like I was I don't know brainwashed all these years yeah. thinking I was going this way but this is my reality. Fourth grade was the first time Maxi ever got teased. Kids would call her gay which is bakla in Filipino. And I was like I don't even know what that is because we never spoke of it in our household. There was never like a talk on. You didn't know anybody yeah, that was gay either. Yeah, not not at all. There was no no talking gender. There was no kind of. Yeah. I don't know introduction to it. Yeah. Maxie explains that this was a very awkward time for her because I would run into kids from school outside of school mm -hmm. at the mall and whatever and they would just like call it out and my parents would be like who's calling you that you know yeah. and it was like devastating I would like freeze and I'd be so like embarrassed by it yeah. but what are you gonna do so right? did you feel like your parents made made 
like you didn't really understand what gay meant, but then seeing their reaction to kids saying that made you feel oh, a yeah. lot more worse. A hundred percent. It yeah. got me more afraid, yeah. you know, and it kind of made me hide more yeah. of myself. And I'm so that awkward. Yeah. yeah. So I found my younger years very awkward because it's just like trying to hide in my shell, but yeah. also wanting to explore who I am. For sure. With this, Maxi was actually really good at sports and played a lot of sports to cover up who she was or who she was getting teased for being. But fast forward to high school, this is where she started to become friends with other gay guys as they all played on the same volleyball team together. Um, we all kind of became like little brothers, yeah. a brotherhood of like <laughs> LGBT. <laughs> so we all got into volleyball. It's funny in the Philippines, volleyball is such a big sport is it? for gay kids really? so we excelled in volleyball like we kicked ass yeah, we game. were varsity volleyball yeah, team right and... <laughs> and so we were obsessed with that sport kind of brought us all together yeah. she had one incident in high school where her teacher who she explains was gay his word on the vine was he was also gay outed her to her parents the seventh grade, my one of my teachers outed me to my parents really? during a, a, a parent-teacher conference. I always exuded that femininity, and that's exactly what he told my parents. It's yeah. like your, you know, your son is emanating a lot of feminine aura, and I just wanted you to know. Pause. Why are you outing? Yeah. You know, this like I'm trying to make little it innocent. Yeah, yeah, I'm like rude. That is not your place, Mr. Teacher. Ah! But wait for it. So Maxie's parents, in response, sent her to church every single day after school for one year in hopes to... Pray the gay away. Did you have a moment where you were even trying to pray the gay away? Where you were convinced that you could... No, right away. not a chance. I was okay. just like, I can't change who I am deep down. I was yeah. just like, I was just praying that there was going to, something was going to change in sure. my life where I could just be myself. Mm -hmm. But at that point, I'm like, I just felt trapped. But before we get to that, let's rewind a little bit. So Maxine, going to school in the Philippines, did you ever experiment at that all boys Catholic school? Like last few years in the Philippines and Catholic school, I, you know, explored my sexuality you did. more. I, I did. Ask. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I mean, everybody's a little bit curious, right? There was this sort of attraction because we were different yeah. to all the other boys, the jocks. It's this weird secret sort of like society of like, they kind of are down. Oh, <laughs> like, so you were like competing yeah. with a bunch of straight guys? Yeah, because oh I God. played ports too, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, my first few times having, you know, my first kiss or stuff with boys was... Mm -hmm. High school, right before I left. Wow. So I high had. High school was not like that. No. <laughs> different. That's what I thought, and I just wanted you guys to hear that juicy juice. Anyways, moving forward, Maxine and her family eventually had the opportunity to move to Canada in grade ten. Like, oh. It my was God. totally mean girls. It's totally mean girls. Some people <laughs> had their their um tables in the cafeteria mm -hmm. and like there was the jocks and all the pretty girls in high school she was able to express herself a little bit more openly you know did you get bullied a lot in the canadian school i did and didn't it's kind of okay. like there was a small percentage that would like you know call me like gay or like you know bag here and mm -hmm. there but it wasn't as grave as i thought it would be mm -hmm. and i think it's because i was fairly you know, good in high school. I was, yeah. you know, on roll. I was in sports. I was uh, friends with all the girls. So. You were friends with all the, like, popular girls. Kind of, not necessarily the popular crew, but, mm -hmm. like, the cool peeps. Yeah. You know, the normal ones. Yeah. <laughs> not, not, like, not the ones that peaked in high school. Yeah. Peaked in high school. Yeah. Peaked in high school. Yeah. We all know what happened to those kids. Oh, <laughs> a little shy. <laughs> now, we fast forward a little bit more to Maxine's first night going out in Vancouver. When I met my first um, trans person. Wow. <laughs> Funny enough, I didn't even know what trans was all these years. Really? So you never knew there was anything that existed? <laughs> I mean, I knew there was another type of being. Mm -hmm. 
in the Philippines, you know, you see them in society, but they're never taken seriously. And it's not like it's discussed, you know, like, yeah. oh, there's just a man dressed as a woman. Yeah. And it's not really explained as being trans. It's not yeah. really given much depth other than... There's a lack of education. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Wow. So when I was clubbing, I think I had just graduated or I was in senior year. It's all blurred. <laughs> like, my timeline. Blurred like, together. <laughs> Um, I was out and I, this girl was just like, hey, you're so femme, are you in transition? Like, you're so pretty, like, wh- what are you doing? Are you in hormones? And like, mm-hmm. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, in yeah. super denial, I'm like, what is she talking about? But also like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Tell me more. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> and then from then on, I was just like, what do you mean? Like, oh, are you trans? And then that's when I went on the internet after that night and like looked it up and I was like, holy crap, people live as this. I wish I knew this sooner. I Mm -hmm. wish I knew that this existed in my world because Mm -hmm. I would have just known that I was something else. Um, From that initial initial conversation with her, um, how did that make you feel? uh, It was like a light bulb moment, Mm -hmm. but also a very scary moment because I'm like, oh my gosh, I thought this entire time this was who I was, yeah. but this, that this is what, like, what I'm seeing, this is who I'm supposed to be. Wow. Yeah. But, because of the fear of, um, you know, how they're treated and doing more research and seeing how it wasn't as um, accepted mm-hmm. in a lot of countries or whatever, I was just, like, so afraid to even attempt to mm-hmm. discuss it or bring it up or talk about it. So it took years before I even um, took it seriously as an option for my life. Wow. Yeah. But then my dad eventually moved to Canada to be with us, worked here for like two, two years, worked himself sick. <laughs> he eventually caught liver cancer or got liver cancer oh and passed away after five months. And within, yeah, it was hard, very so hard. Sorry. Uh and within that grieving period, I kind of realized, okay, life is so freaking short, <laughs> so short. And that's when I kind of took it more seriously to live life as myself. Yeah. Uh, eventually, when I did decide to come out as trans, the first people I went to were my brothers. Wow. Crazy enough. Because wow. I'm like, guys, here's the deal. And what did they think? And they were so cool. They were like, <laughs> literally... It was like, okay, we already knew you were different. Yeah. It makes sense almost because yeah. you're so femme. Even when you were gay, people were already mentioning like you're more girly than most girls are. Yeah. So it was like a natural progression. So they didn't really blink an eye. It was more for me to educate them on what it was. Mm-hmm. I love that they accepted you right then. And they yeah. were just like, you know, what, you're into your journey. Yeah. Um, a lot of it too came from that grieving stage for my dad. Like... Yeah. I, there's a lot of denial and also fear of coming out. And so how I took for, I, my dad passed when I was 23 and I came out when I was 24, mm-hmm. but there's that long phase of in between. in between where I really took it out of my body. So I had so much like anonymous sex and stuff like that because oh. I, I, I was just trying to get affirmation and validation from random strangers and men through wow. us like grinder and stuff for me to feel like something mm-hmm. did you feel no yeah. i was numb i was numb all throughout that process because yeah. i just felt like hey it's really just my body that's being because i also felt like i didn't belong in the gay community so yeah. this was my way to kind of like my last ditch effort to feel like i belonged Except in the gay belonging. community yeah and i just didn't feel like anything at all it was like i just felt so numb yeah. And it was a dangerous and dark phase, yeah. and that's when I really hit rock bottom, um, having that, you know, just men use me. Yeah. And it was a matter of, like, life and death at that point. I'm like, I can't keep doing this. I hate myself. I hate my body. I hate my shell. And I literally made a list of pros and cons, whether to keep living as I am, mm-hmm. which is like this fraud, fraudulent life, yeah. or just commit suicide, wow. which was super dark. And then I realized, like, well, why does it have to be this yeah. and keep living as this lie? Why can't it just be maybe suicide or just be trans? And then eventually, <laughs> the pros of being trans 
you know, there was a few things like, okay, you're going to be yourself. Yeah. You'll be able to not waste your time on, the, on, the, on earth and just, yeah. you know, be able to live free. But the con was like, okay, you're going to be ostracized. You're going to mm-hmm. be different. You're going to mm-hmm. be a freak and all these, like, negative things. But at the end of the day, I'm like, I'd rather live as those yeah. than have to, like, disappear. What was, the, what was your mentality on, like, because what you were saying is that you were deciding between suicide or not. Yeah. What was that factor that just told you, like, there's something else out there and there's something better for you and your life is going to be way... I think what it was was realizing that my family was always going to be there for me. Yeah. That was a really important part of the decision because they had already loved me through all of these confusing years. Yeah. What's a little bit more, you know? And also seeing how my family grieved losing my dad. Mm-hmm. And if I had done the same, like, it's so unfair. Yeah. And also thinking about my brothers and, like, I couldn't do that to them. Yeah. Um, so that kind of really pulled me more closer wow. to deciding to just live and be different and be scared mm-hmm. but at least you're alive and you're there for your loved ones kind yeah. of thing i'm very lucky and very privileged to have a family that didn't turn their back on me super super lucky okay so you t- came up to your family as trans mm-hmm. and what was the next steps after that so when i had this was in 2014, so the steps I took, I saw a, um, I think it was um, a nonprofit organization, mm-hmm. um, and they had nurses where you could speak to them, and they could eventually prescribe you um, hormones. Mm-hmm. So initially, I had to go on a six-month wait, which mm-hmm. killed me, but I was super patient. I was like, I need, I need this. These are the necessary steps. So within that period, I just took the time to like really ease my way into a living full-time female. So I was already kind of androgynous at that point. So I kind of just kept going more in that direction to eventually when I got my treatment, um, I kind of slowly told my, my brothers, my best friends, like, yo, I'm transitioning. You're going to see some changes soon. Don't be yeah. shocked. So by New Year's, or Christmas, New Year's of 2014 into 2015. Yeah, I just showed up with a full head of extensions. I love and that. Yeah, I showed up to my mom like, so mom, this is the deal. This is me now. She's like, she oh, about? you look so beautiful. I'm like, thanks, mom. So and then beautiful. I told her I was going to be on HRT. And that's yeah. when she was, her concern came about. And I'm like, don't worry. Yeah. These are what I need to do to like live as myself. And you know, that's the best thing when your mom is more concerned about your health and stuff versus yeah. like all the kafluffle I'm like you're yeah. so sweet <laughs> yeah for sure um okay can you educate me a little bit on HRT yeah so it's hormone replacement therapy so mm-hmm. essentially with my body you know naturally I pump out testosterone mm-hmm. so I take testosterone blockers to kind of nullify that and put it at a healthy level yeah. comparative to females and then I take estrogen and also progesterone which I did for a couple years to heighten my female hormones and then that essentially also changes my body and the appearance so it softens my features uh, fat distribution changes so you know you get more curvy Mm -hmm. your breasts develop uh, and yeah that's crazy it's crazy science is insane yeah science is insane. (laughs) insane and then again over the course of those years, you can choose to get, you know, your top surgery, your bottom surgery, whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but for me, my biggest thing was my appearance. So mm-hmm. my dysphoria and dysmorphia is more of my reflection, how I look, not necessarily what I was born with. So I think for different trans girls, there's, I think, two avenues. Mm-hmm. It's more so about, like I mentioned, for me, it's my appearance, my reflection, mm-hmm. how I represent myself um and it's more that feminine aura being and really embracing that yeah uh and then there's more of that avenue of it's about what your makeup is which is your genitalia and right. stuff and so sometimes and some trans women prefer to just go straight for sexual reassignment yeah. whereas for me it's more so working towards getting to my goal of how i want to appear and you know be wow. in the world yeah 
I totally get that. Yeah, it's like my outer shell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when I hear that song by Mulan, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> from yeah. Mulan, yeah. there's this girl I see staring straight back at me, which is like so profound. I'm like, yeah, that's totally my life. Thanks guys for tuning in and thank you Maxi for joining us and being so open and brave and sharing your story. If you guys like this video, please like, subscribe and comment and tune back in for part two next week. Yes, there is going to be a part two. Next week, we're going to dive a little bit more into Maxine's life, what it was like navigating the dating scene, some of the biggest things that she's had to overcome in her life and what she thinks is going to move the LGBTQ community forward and some just a little bit of words of wisdom from Maxine. So tune back in next week. Can't wait to see you. Ciao for now.